Okay, good evening. Uh, today, the plan for this evening is to complete this, uh, uh, this topic that we started uh, last week. So, as I told you last week, this is the last topic of this course and we are going through it today tomorrow we will have an exercise video recorded uh, about this here we will see a simple quite simple example of a chi-square test this is one of those statistical not parametric tests that we are going to speak about today and tomorrow we will see a slightly more complicated version not ex excessively complicated something that you can compute with just pen and paper without any really difficult uh, formula or something like that and just to recap on thursday we will have our last lab that is supervised work group from 10 to 11 30 and from 11 30 up to 1 pm uh, we will have a uh, exam simulation written exam simulation that will not be video recorded because it's you know a real simulation so we will give you a piece of paper with the actual test of an exam you will do it in in the amount of time that is expected for the exam so it's no way to register 50 minutes of silence and then we will see we will show the i will show you the the solution and we will also publish the solution on the website so if you are not if you will not be in the class you will always have access to to the solution and additional example but today let's continue to speak about a controlled experiment just to, to recap uh, just to recap what is a controlled experiment and this is a question your personal definition of control, uh, controlled experiment. And this will be the first question of your exam. <laughs> so another question, the difference between a control experiment and a usability test, why we're having two things? There are a lot of options, but the, the most reasonable one is that. Don't be shy. You follow script in both of them. Yeah. In which one? In this controlled experiment, you follow, let's say, a scientific method, you have an hypothesis that you would like to verify or better as we have seen last week you would like to reject that hypothesis the, the null hypothesis and you want to accept the alternative hypothesis that happens to be the opposite of the null hypothesis and this scientific it does another difference big difference enormous difference that you are doing something that in the other in the usability testing you will you're not you are co comparing different factor different aspects of uh, an interface of your interface your app with another app uh, your a version of your home page with a version of another version of your own page while in the usability evaluation you just get as as is written i think in the second slide here uh, you just get a bunch of people looking at your interface and say okay this is working i don't understand how to do this i don't understand to do that and you don't have a comparison you don't have you have some metrics but they are not analyzed let's say scientifically you analyze really from a quantitative and let's say deep point of view so here to continue the recap since it seemed to be needed we identified that there are some kind of different kind of variables there are independent variables that are dependent variables uh, right you remember more or less and 
we have an hypothesis, as I told you, and the hypothesis is to be framed with respect to the independent variable mainly and also with the dependent variable in some cases. And here, do you remember this? We have uh, an example in which we have how many independent variable? It's written somewhere, but no, three, it's the wrong answer. Two, it's the right answer, yeah. And why we have this table with six column uh, at most, if we have just two variables? Yeah, for each variable we have a level, and a level is a different, just just repeating, a different value that the variable can assume. And here we have the combination of these two variables that have one, the first, uh, let's say, a row, a variable that is a number of menu item that it happens to be three levels, the three item menu, the five item menu, and the seven item menus, and the second independent variable that has two level each, textual versus not only textual uh, level, and this is a combination overall of six of multiple cases. And this is the only way in which you can create this table. This is something I didn't told you last time, but this is a good point. I could have created this table with this two independent, two independent variable with the same level in a different way. Or this is really the only way in which I could have created this, bar, this table. No, it's al always a two row table in any case, but Exactly. We can have, this is a version, given this variable, given their levels, we can have a version of this table in which we have on the top uh, row the three uh, levels of the first variable and for each of them the two levels of the second variable, or we can have the reverse. In the first row the two level of the second variable and for each under textual label we have three items, five items, seven items and for textile label plus icon, three items, five items, seven items. In the end, it's all, it's the same thing, same range of combination. What change, what may change, it's maybe in the procedure that you are going to use, hmm? that was this experimental method that we uh, mostly ended the lecture about this, between subject or within subject. Hmm? Obviously, if you have a between subject, uh, here you have uh, maybe a mixed approach in which you have between subject for items menu and a within subject for this, you have three people. If you have the reverse, you just have two group, not three people, three groups of people. Uh, in the reverse, you have two group of people because you are discriminating for two in the top level. But just uh, as, as before, as a recap, these two experimental methods, we say that we can perform an experiment with two main methods. I told you last time that this mainly apply to people, and this is why they call the between subject, but they can also not apply to people. Obviously, in what I didn't tell you is that typically in human computer interaction apply to people. But you can have, I don't know, there is a subfield of human computer interaction, this is called animal computer interaction. So I, I don't know exactly what they did, but you have uh, this, it exists. So you may have a between cats or within cats um, experiment if you are experimenting with cats or between dogs if you are experimenting with dogs. But the main thing is that typically it's people that are performing different conditions to, to have an experiment. But it's 99% of the time is people, not always, obviously. Uh, so between subject versus within subject, each participant in between subject perform under one condition only. Hmm? So we have one people, one in the table before, and this is the recap again, 
In the table before, we have one people with a three items menu, text or label. One people different from before with a three item menu, text or label plus icon. Another different people for the five item text or label, and so on. In the within subject, you instead have so advantages, no transfer of learning, since each condition is performed by totally different people, they cannot learn from what they have seen before because they didn't see anything before nor after. Uh, these advantages, you need more user. If you want to test all that condition, you need uh, six people. Uh, and the group of people, in, in just in case you don't use six, but 12 people, 24 people, have to be balanced in the number, in the, in the experience, in whatever you are exploring, you're studying, and this variation between groups, between people, can also bias in some, ki in some, in some sort, in some way, the results. The other method is within subject, in which each participant perform the experiment under all the conditions. So you have one people, one person that perform all the six conditions, one after the other. Advantages, it's less costly, less people needed, less likely to, use, to suffer from user variation. Disadvantage, you have some transfer of learning possible because, for instance, here, when a person came here, he already know that he will encounter a textual label menu and then a textual plus label icon. And here, when it repeat the same condition, you already know what, what to spot before, what to expect. After this textual label five item, it expect probably a textual label plus icon five item because this is what happened in the past and so on. And so this is a disadvantage of the within uh, subject that is possible to minimize. And we will see today how and this within subject is also called repeated measure, measure because you repeat for the same person the same uh, experiment, the same condition over and over. And when more than one independent variable is present, it's possible also to mix between and within subject. For instance, having the first independent variable in within, in between, and the second in within, or, or vice versa. And as I told you before, there are, last week, there are cases in which you are sort of forced to use one of these two experimental methods. So if you want to, for instance, uh, uh, have an ex understand if your train application is more suitable for uh, people under 21 years old or great, with more than 21 years old, uh, you have two separate groups. One person either has less than 21 or more than 21 he are sold. It's not possible to have, except the equivalence that you have to put in one of the two group. It's not possible to have a person that is contemporary 18 years old and 31 years old. Mm. So you have, obviously, you, you want two groups that are separate or expert travelers versus not expert or expert uh, in gym, at home, or not expert, novices. So you have obviously two groups and that it's the variable is to be done in between subjects because you have two separate group of people in which you want to experiment with. Uh, so in, in within subject, we have this problem of a transfer learning um, that is, participant may perform better on the second condition, the third condition, the fourth condition, because they benefited from the practice they have. Mm -hmm. So in a user interface, maybe it's not really understandable, but if you, it's possible, obviously, but it's not immediate if you think about um, testing an hardware device, a new kind of mouse, for instance, you obviously, when you receive the second time the same mouse, you. Uh, app before or a new keyboard the configuration for writing you learn how to use it so later uh, conditions are easier for for the user and another disadvantages of uh, within subject is that fatigue may be also an issue too long experiment could be uh, 
stressful and hard to sustain for a long time. So the experiment should be designed in an appropriate way. Not too long, not too short, right uh, at the point you want to collect data for measuring and reject your null hypothesis. So how to solve or at least minimize this transfer of learning problem? Uh, you can uh, minimize at least uh, this um, transfer of learning by counterbalancing your experiment, the task in your experiment, the condition in your experiment. So counterbalancing, uh, the definition is divide the participant into groups virtually into groups not needed to divide the participant actually into groups during the experiment and administer the condition in a different order for each group. That means that if I have two tasks A and B, participant number one will receive the task, the, the experiment in the condition A and then we'll see the condition B and the second participant will see instead before the condition B and then the condition A the third participant will see condition A followed by B, and so on and so forth. So you have two virtual groups. One is all the people that are receiving, experimenting with condition A followed by condition B, and the other group that is the same amount of people that will experiment with condition B and followed by condition A. So you are trying in this way to minimize learning effects because half of the people will see before a, and so what they learn from A, they will um, use it while doing B, but the other half of the people is seeing before B, so what they are learning are using before to, to A, so this is some sort of balance this transfer of learning. And there are quite some way to counterbalance a task uh, condition. The most common way to counterbalance is using a balanced uh, latin square a latin square is something like this the picture here is a table n per n so it's squared as the, the name that is filled with n different symbol positioned such that each symbol occur exactly once in each row, row and in each columns and n uh, are the number level typically so uh, in this case when you want to counter the fully counterbalance the number of levels of the independent variable must divide equally into the numbered participant so as I told you before you have a and b condition a and b for the first participant condition b and a for the second participant you should have at least four participants not three because if you have three you are not really balancing because you have one more people in the first condition than in the second condition so in this case you, you should have two four six eight a number divided by two to maintain two equal group for each row of the table so in the example is one independent variable with three level you may have 12 participants also six participants. It's just a number that is possible to divide, to divide fully by this number of three. And so here we have some example of this Latin square. You can continue to create that. Uh, and this is one alternative to counterbalancing a task for reducing or minimizing the transfer of learning. And uh, so here we have just just some examples. So in the first case you have A followed by B and B followed by A is this one Here you have ABC first line great BCA second line and then CAB In the third line And, and so on AB Notice here that there is something probably strange. We will come it out in a moment. A, B, D, C. We not start with A, B, C, D. A, B, D, C, B, C, A, D, and so on. And this is the case with five uh, per five 
um, levels. Mm? And you can build how many of these tables you want. The alternative of, for, for the Latin square is a full counterbalancing of levels that is n factorial. You can use the n factorial to counterbalance and have all the possibility, all the possible combination of a task. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, counterbalance with n factorial at three level, you have a much more bigger, uh, which much more raw table of this, because you consider every possible combination of A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. And so you need more probably than three people to test this because you have a six level table so you have uh, at least six people mm -hmm. so two questions uh, as i told you before in this four per four you have a b d c not a b c d and following this way you can read it and so why having this first matrix and not the second one that for instance in the first row has a b c d and then also the second row is different also the third row is different and also obviously the fourth row is different why the first one is most appropriate than the second one look at the number uh, sorry the letters and who is coming before and after another letter in the first we have uh, more random more randomness in the second we have uh, in the first row a b c d and in the last row this and a b c d again i don't know mm, not really yeah it could be a factor but it's not the the important point here so look at a and b and count how many times b followed a and how many time a followed b in the first and in the second matrix in the row for instance horizontally how many times b is following a for each row how many times b is following a in the first matrix okay no a is before b is after a not just after in the, in the next cell but it's after in the in the line two and vice versa a two in the other three so they are not really balanced you may have an a b effect that you are not balancing so that's why i i, I wrote here a balanced latin square because the second one is a, a latin square it's a totally perfect fine latin square it's not balanced because you have an effect between task so if you have a learning effect between a and b you are not correctly minimizing it in the second one obviously if you use the n factorial for all of these you have much more cases but you are pretty sure to minimize everything and we don't have the same problem here the same problem so here this is exactly the same table that they put here a b c b c a c a b and it's, it's the same so why the first one is problematic and the second one is not or, or why i put it in the slide as the correct um, matrix so two questions one is we have the same problem here or not and the second one if we have the same problem why it's correct let's say the number of letters you got sorry the number of letters you got this is the answer to the second, uh, the second question the first is we have the same problem or not yes yes why when, in, where 
for instance. For example, I live, live or lost a, a few times. Two times. And the answer is because the number of, uh, of row and column is odd, so it's not possible to fully uh, counterbalance. How we can solve it? We can ignore it and live happy, or we can. No, no, we have just three levels. We cannot generate a fourth level randomly just to have. We have three levels, three, three items menu, five item menus, and seven it item menus. And we are, we love them and we are sticking to them. We'll never change three, five, and seven item that is A, B, and C. And we can have a full, we can lie with it. No problem. We, we know that we, we may generate a, a transfer of learning, but maybe we have 30 people. And so we try to have a lot of people experimenting with this and hopefully to this effect is not too big. But there is a way not using Latin square, obviously, to solve this problem. That is, I already told you two times in the last five minutes, I think, 10 minutes, that is not using a Latin square, but yeah, and factorial. In that way, you have a full combination of everything. So you are solving this problem because you have more row. So you generate all the possible, you again, balance everything. Good. So when you create a control experiment, uh, again, a sort of recap, you defined uh, independent variables, you defined a goal, hypothesis, independent variable, yeah. For example, the table four by four. Hmm. There is one group that does a, no, I don't this slide. It's the same. The, a group does the first row, or a group does all the row numbers, all the columns. Um. A participant let's say so let's imagine to have four people that's it's easier because I, I don't want to speak about the group because between subject within subject okay it may change in a within subject manner since these are used for a within subject if you have four people the first person will do the first row the second person will do the second row the same task in that order the third person will do the, the same A, B, C, D task in that order, the third row, and the fourth person will have the same task in, the, in that order of the fourth row. If you have eight people, you will start from scratch. So the fifth people will have the task in the order of the first row and so on. Or you can also have the first two people having this A, B, C, D, uh, A, B, D, C, the people, participant number three and four, the second row, participant number, any combination. The, the point is, have the same number of people for each row. Okay. Also, go back to the, the levels must divide equally to the number of participants. Yeah. Because otherwise we have, I don't know, two people on the first, two people on the second, two people on the third, and one people on the, on the fourth. So you're not minimizing the effects. Because for uh, a chain of, of tasks, you are not equally minimize the effect as the other. Can I decide if uh, I have four people and uh, everyone has to do all the four rows? Why? The, you, you are saying to me that we have four people and you want the person number one. Let, let me understand if I understood correctly. Person number one is having A, B, D, C, B, C, A, D that way. Why? You are asking a person to redo the same task for time, the same identical task for time. Because, you know, A, B, D, C are just letter here, but in reality are try the application with a three level menu that is A. And then if you, every time it is A is the same identical task that you are going to have. Click on the first voice on the three level menu. So it's, it's useless. You can, obviously, but it's why? Okay. Yeah. In this way. Yeah. 
And you put two people here. Yes. You minimize the effect, but then, obviously, yes, you minimize the transfer effect in some way. And then you, you know, you have two problems doing that. The first one is that, uh, yeah, basically it's one problem, is that you have one person that is doing this sequence. So let's imagine that there is a transfer of learning here. There is no transfer of learning in this, in this situation, and there is no transfer of learning in this situation, the third situation. But you have a transfer of learning here. And so you put two people in the worst condition for transfer of learning. So in that case, it's not a really, uh, you are not solving the problem. You are stressing the problem. Obviously, if you have the same amount of a transfer of learning, or if you have, you know, but it's difficult to know at the beginning that you have a transfer of learning between B and C in that order, you, you can assign it's less transfer of learning, you assign more people, so you sort of balance, but it, you don't know in the beginning if you have this transfer of learning or not. And w what is different between all of them? And most importantly, if you, this is fine for balancing, this is reasonable. If you, think that for instance for a and b and c you are uh, registering time then you have just one sample for times here one sample for time the third row and two sample for time here so when you perform a mean of all participants you are balancing condition weighting condition in a slightly different way okay if you want to solve it just this, this version, you can, I told you before, say, okay, there could be an effect here. It's okay. I acknowledge that could be an effect. So in my result, I would say there could be an effect here. And because it's not possible with Latin square to fully balance, or you can use N factorial so that you have, you balance everything. You just need more people. But in this case, it's just, Three people is quite quite low as a number, uh, as as we as I told you last time. While for usability testing is the, the magic number is five, here the magic number is much more than five, hmm? at least double. So if you have three, you don't have three people. You typically have nine people. So full counterbalancing uh, could work. M factor. Three factorial is equal to uh, six. six. So you generate a table of three columns, six row, and for each you say you, you put it every combination. So A, B, C, B, C, A, every possible combination of, of them. It's just a longer table, but in that way you don't have also here in the four per four you can have a full counterbalancing is just uh, much a uh, table with much more row and you need much more participant obviously okay any other question about counterbalancing so for instance uh Open parenthesis. For instance, um, a question in uh, on this part on, on a written exam could be given an independent variable with three level, write a uh, balanced Latin square. Four level, write a balanced Latin square. For instance, it could be a simple exercise. Or how many people do you need at least for uh, counterbalancing a within subject study with uh, uh, independent variable with three level or given a between subject study write a counterbalancing a latin square matrix and the answer is not possible because you know between subject no need to counterbalance okay uh, 
Okay, another question here, close parenthesis. Let's continue with this. Nope. So, I was saying that uh, in, a, in, in a control experiment, you have something that you want to test to make a parallel. You write a null hypothesis, an alternative hypothesis with respect to the independent and dependent variable that you generate, you, you, you fixed, and you then decide if you want a between subject, uh, within subject, you write a table like this to decide to take note of task, for instance, and the sequence of participants. So here we have one participant that's doing before the three item in textual and then the three item in textual plus icon. If you write the table in the different, in the alternative way, you have the first participant that is doing uh, the three item with textual and then the five item with textual. So you have a different order of task and different meaning for task. You do all of these, you decide if you, have, if you want to have a within subject, between subject, if you decide for a mixed or a within, you can, you have to counterbalancing fully, partially. In real life, you, you may not be able to have, I don't know, 12 participants with a four level experiment because you, you are not able to get these people. And so you, you accept, you recognize that the experiment is not fully counterbalanced because it's not possible if you have nine people for uh, this uh, four per four um, Latin square you, is not fully counterbalanced the experiment. The task may be if you have enough people, but it also happens in real life that you cannot have the exact number of people that you like. You, you have two, you, you should try to have, but it always happens. So you, at that point you have condition, you have task, you have everything and you start writing your procedure. And the procedure is, is just this slide here because it's basically 99% the same thing. It's very similar, let's say, to the usability testing procedure. So you have a consent form for uh, video recording people, for ethics, for whatever uh, you need. And then you have some task, you measure the task, you need to instrument your user interface if, if you want to, I don't know, register how many time pass from clicking button A to clicking button B or for completing a task in theory. Maybe you want to know that in condition number one, you keep, you have um, less time than condition number two. So you have to, to memorize, to record in some way times for each condition for all the participant. And so you have, just a script in some way similar to the script that you have uh, for usability testing. If you give instruction to your participant, they should be, uh, it's more important here, the exactly same instruction to everybody so that everybody has the same identical task. Mm -hmm. Try to select the first element in the three item menu and everybody should do that. Not that the first is the, the first element in the in the three item menu and the second is just a random element, but exactly the same procedure because it's repeated, it's controlled. So you are experimenting with some specific factor or some specific condition. And so this is basically the same. You have measure as before that in our case are dependent variable, not just random, random measure. You can have the briefing session, you can have a questionnaire as in the follow up in the beginning, because maybe you want also to uh, separate expert people from not, not expert people. So you are asking people in a beginning in initial questionnaire if they are expert in the topic or not and how much with a Likert scale question from one to five, for instance. So all these still apply here. Uh, it, it's everything else that all this stuff that change. And when you create a task in some way, in some cases, the task is trivial to, to define like pro probably in our uh, three item menu example, just select the first element, second element, a random element, which is the right task for that. For the task, it depends from, from what we want to collect, to measure. But in general, generally speaking, uh, a good task should both represent the condition and discriminate between condition. So it should be representative of the activity people will do with an interface. 
So if we want to experiment, we sign up, the task should, should uh, follow a normal sign up procedure, what the people are doing typically in their life. And also to discriminate between conditions. That is having a task that to stress, that highlight further. Obviously, it's, it's in the nature of the task, in the nature of the condition, there is already a difference. Three item menu versus five item menu, it's evident the difference. But the task should also further highlight the different effects between this condition, if possible. It's a, this is a good task. A pretty good task is just maybe representative. In some cases, it's obviously how to discriminate because it's really the condition that discriminate uh, about the task. And as before, as in the usability testing, you have a list of tasks with metrics that are our dependent variables and what you want to, to measure to respond to your, um, to refuse, to reject your null hypothesis. Everything clear up to now? So now the, the fun part. Um, you decide your null hypothesis, you decide your task, write up your procedure, balance your four per four um, conditions experiment, you recruit 12 participants, perfectly balanced and more or less all the same age with the same expertise because you want to, to experiment with same kind of people, you run the experiment, it took one week, two weeks, whatever it took, uh, whatever it takes, and you have data at that point. You completed your experiment, you have table of data with times, with each participant, I don't know, participant number one, in the task number one, took three seconds, participant number two, participant number one, task number two, it took three seconds, and so on. You keep this data, you have this data, you apply that within subject, uh, for instance, methodology, so you reorganize your result so that every participant is list with the same, uh, in the same way, so all the participants in the final table, the final results, will have uh, the result for the first task, then the result of a second task, no matter how they actually uh, executed the task during the experiment. And that way you have numbers, data, some qualitative data, some quantitative data, you can look at it and maybe understand some trend as you probably uh, will do for the usability testing but here we go a step further and is applying some statistical measure so before uh, going to this two disclaimer the first one that is that is the here is the second one is that we are not going deep on this topic uh, because it's behind this, the topic, the, the scope of this course, because this is statistics, basic, basically. So what we would like to, to show you is that for some kind of experiment, uh, typically, or it's better to use some statistical methods than the other. And this statistical method as a name, for instance, a t-test or a ANOVA, there are statistical methods that apply to da data under certain conditions, but we will not describe absolutely how this method works or how to compute them, because typically they are complex to do manually, and because there are software, programming language like R, that can perform this computation for you. So just to give you an idea of what it's possible to do and when to apply which method, and we, we will instead have a look to one, specific test that is the chi-square test because it's easier to to do it we can do it manually with because it's just one subtraction and a couple of um, one multiplication something like that so it's quite easy to, to do it to understand and this is the first disclaimer the second disclaimer is that before applying any statistical test in the life not just here you must, you must always look at data. So keep, take your table, plot it, show it, have a look at the number. Because for instance, it can expose outlier. So data that you 
may want to not consider because obviously it's out of scale this participant. So maybe you remove the participant. And when you maybe write about this in a report or whatever it is, you say we have 12 participants and we discarded one participant because it, it was drug. It was drunk. So it, it just uh, happened things randomly and it was clear because this and that. So it was an outlier and we perform all the computation with 11 participants, hmm? for instance. So here there is an example more realistic of an outlier. You have a participant looking at data. You have a participant that took three times as long as everybody else on a single task. And you may ask why? It has something particular, this participant, some expertise particular, some difference in ages in gender, in whatever it is, it's my enemy, and so it, it does this for, for a reason or not. And, and this is the second important part, you know that the participant uh, was sick that day. You know, because you maybe have seen it, him or her, and so you decide that obviously this time as they are three times bigger than all the other participants, you have 12, 12 participants, 19 are under certain range, and just one is three times that range. And you know that the participant is sick, you can discard that participant from the result of your experiment. Maybe not the qualitative analysis, maybe not the response to the questionnaire, but the actual data, measurable data, it could be removed. Obviously, you have to know all these things. You're going to say, ah, this is a number that I don't, don't like, just remove it. Because it, it doesn't confirm my alternative hypothesis. You have, you have to have some reason, some valid reason to do this. But you cannot uh, know this if you don't look at data. Maybe this person was sick that day, but it behaved normally or in the range as the other people. You, you know after conducting the experiment, after seeing data. So, these are the two disclaimers. Let's speak to statistical analysis now. So, the choice of any statistical analysis depends typically on three kinds of information. The type of data. What is the type of data? How many type of data we can have? Who knows? <laughs> no, no type of data in that way. We are, let's, mm, you know, it's true. But uh, <laughs> statistically speaking, we don't have string. Um, we have words, maybe. But uh, uh, yeah, the type of data we not that type of data, not the type from a programming language. Categorical. Yeah, categorical, number, uh, ratio, interval, etc. Uh, so this is one, because you cannot apply some statistical tests to all of this. Some statistical tests can be applied only to uh, continuous or discrete number, for instance, and other could be also applied to categorical or, or so on. And this is the first things that we need to, to know. Obviously, uh, in this specific case, we also uh, need to know how many independent variables we have, how many levels we have, but this is something that we decided in the experimental design. So, the first thing after all this information is the type of data, the information required, what we want to, what we want to try to understand from this data. This should be something that emerged from our alternative hypothesis or from our, from our null hypothesis. And this information required could be, as an example, is there a difference between these two factors? Uh, how big is this different? These are two separate questions. You may have one test to understand if there is a difference. And this test say anything about how big this difference is. It just says there is or there's not. And then you may also would like to know if there is a difference, how big it is. And this could be another set, another kind of test or maybe just the first one, the one, one test provide our answer to both, uh, to both questions, or how is the estimate? 
and so on. So which information you want to, to gather from this, this data, from this experiment, and the data distribution. If you plot the data, it's a normal distribution. You remember more normal distributions? The Gaussian-like, okay? Uh, it's a uh, T-student distribution that is not, um, that is a real distribution, it's called T-student, not for students like you, but it's the name. That is a different kind of distribution. So which is the data distribution? These three type of information. So let's start from the first one, since just yeah, we have just one response. Very, very quickly, we have four types of data in general. Uh, the first one is nominal. These are in order of, let's say, power. The last one is the most powerful, the most expressive. The, fir the first one is the less expressive. So the nominal type of data is categorical data. That is, we arbitrarily, or by convention, assign a code to mutually exclusive attributes or category. An example nominal data are car license number, codes for postal zone, mutually exclusive category. If you are in a postal zone, you cannot be also in another postal zone. You just have one of them. And they are just category. This instead is called this nominal, but it's also called categorical data because it's just category, different category. You cannot perform mean on categorical data. What is the mean of two postal code? You can because there are number, obviously. You can sum up and divide by two, but it doesn't have any sense in that among co postal codes. And this is nominal data. Then you have ordinal data. That is again uh, categorical data, but they have an order or ranking. So the first choice, the second choice, the third choice. Military ranking is ordinal data. You have some category that is of a upper level than other categories. It's, there is an, an order. And also in this case, you cannot compute mean which is the mean between a general and a lieutenant. Then we have interval and ratio data. Again, more expressive. These two could be either continuous or discrete. They are typically number. Uh, interval data is data with equal distance between adjacent values. That doesn't have, as the definition, no absolute zero. So, for instance, the Celsius temperature scale is an interval data. Because between one degree and two degree, there is the same distance between two degree and three degree, or between 21 and 22, or 40 and 41. The same distance between adjacent value. And it has no absolute zero. You have minus one degree, minus 12 degree, and so on. And in this case, it's continuous, the Celsius temperature scale. And then we have the ratio data. That is the most sophisticated, that have, have the same attributes as the category before, but also they have an absolute zero, like time, like all the physical measurements. You cannot have one, min one minus one meter. You measure starting from zero or age, you cannot be minus three years old. Hmm? These two can compute mean because they are number. So, a question for you. Uh, Likert scale, Likert scale, hmm? when you use a Likert scale, between zero, 1 and 5 in a questionnaire. Do you know, like a scale? So 1 is less probable, less frequent, 5 is the most frequent, and 2, 3, and 4 in the between. Are interval data or ordinal data? How many people say ordinal? 
six. How many people say interval? One. One and a half. So, if you want to um, generate a huge discussion with a statistician, a statistician or also software engineer that works in empirical measurement, just ask this question and say, no, it's interval or it's um, uh, ordinal. Because, okay, uh, a Likert scale is ordinal data, but typically, uh, it's considered as an interval data. In practice, it's considered as an ordinal data. You, uh, if, you, if you read some control experiment with Likert scale, you find mean computed out of Likert scale. That is not possible to compute mean for an ordinal data. Well, you can for interval. Because there is an assumption that is more or less implicitly made that a Likert scale as an equal distance between 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 and so on due to the label and to, do, to the description that you do in the question for uh, collecting the data. So, uh, so there is a huge discussion. There is some people that say 50-50, say, oh, it's interval. It's fine to compute means, uh, obviously, because it's interval. And you have this assumption uh, said by voice because you have labels upon the number, because you have a question that contextualizes the actual uh, answer, and there is another 50% of people that say, no, it's ordinal. I don't care the labels. So it depends on who you, you speak with, with, you can have different answer. Uh, when they will decide, we, will, we can know the, what they decide, but right now we have this ambivalence for Likert scale. So typically, in human-computer interaction, is considered an interval, interval uh, type of data. You compute mean out of a Likert scale. Among, for instance, all the participants say that they quite like our interface with a mean of 4.3 and a standard deviation of 0 0.5. Yes. Because there is not an absolute zero, it starts from one. Or you can also have, uh, so typically Likert scale starts from one and go to five or to seven or to nine, but you can also have Likert scale from minus, to minus two to plus something. So it depends if I say that there is a, an absolute zero, it's a ratio. Yeah, basically. Also for the age, if I say I start from zero. The age is, you can have an, uh, my, minor than zero age. You can be minus something years old. <coughs> for, for count is, I'm counting things, not count like number. I'm counting things. You cannot have minus three microphone here. Oh, you have a zero microphone. One in this case, but two also, really. It's for count is more for counting things in, in the real world in this way. Okay? It's. Um, okay, so this ambivalence about Likert data. So for sure it's not ratio, for sure it's not categorical, it could be ordinal interval. Uh, choose the philosophy you like, and if you if you uh, compute means with Likert data is interval. If you don't want to compute means uh, with Likert data and you want to consider as nominal, just compute uh, uh, the medium, the, not the medium, the mode of, uh, of the information to have a, an aggregate number. So according to the type of data, you can have two different uh, family of tests. So basically we have in, in HCI, we have two kind of two families. One are parametric tests, and the other one is not parametric test. Not parametric test can apply to every type of data. You can have parametric tests with nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio data. 
different, obviously, per test, but you can apply a non-parametric test to everything. Instead, parametric tests only apply to interval and ratio data. They don't apply to ordinal and nominal type of data. Uh, non-parametric tests have a limited use for ratio data. They can be, there is some par non-parametric tests for ratio data, but in practice they are not used. And they are, in some way, distribution free. So they have no or very few assumptions about the distribution of the data that is behind the actual data to be used. Instead, parametric tests assume data from a given probability distribution. So to use a t-test, you should have, for instance, a normal distribution of data, or a t distribution of data, or a quasi-normal distribution of data. So something that is reasonably a distribution, a normal distribution. You have to check it if there is data is in this distribution. With non-parametric tests, most of the time you don't care a lot. However, so up to now you say, why don't using non-parametric tests? They have less constraint. Some of them have no constraint, others are just less constraint. Parametric test has instead strong constraint. They are quite more useful, more used, because they are more powerful. That is, powerful means that given the same set of data, a parametric test with the, con the condition uh, solved might detect a difference that the non-parametric test may skip, may miss. So they're more powerful in the sense that they are more say, sensible, they are more able to get differences where the other can miss some difference because they are more they have not strong assumptions so they don't know what data to, to expect so in practice uh, there is quite a large use of parametric tests in nor when the distribution is normal or semi-normal or quasi-normal or assumed to normal also because they are powerful and stronger so they can uh, behave better quite good, in a quite good way, also if the distribution is not perfectly normal, if there are some skew, they work way better than non-parametric tests. And here there is a table that you have to learn by memory, obviously. Um, no, it's not. I'm joking. Um, that put together the experiment design, the number of independent variables, the level of each independent variable and the type of test that commonly is not all the tests that you that exist in in the world it's just the most commonly used parametric test in human computer interaction so if you have a between subject study with one independent variable and two level you have you typically it, it's safe to perform under certain condition an independent sample t-test while if you have uh, within subject with two or more hmm, and you have to remember that three is what we call the upper limit reasonable upper limit for independent variable so two or more uh, independent variables two or more levels for uh, for each independent variable then you have you it's it's useful it's typically used a repeated measure ANOVA that is one kind of ANOVA if you have a mixed design Obviously, you have two independent variables at least because it's mixed, mixed between subject and within. You cannot have just one with two or more level because you are comparing things. So you cannot have just one level. And you, for instance, use a split, split plot ANOVA. A split plot ANOVA. That is another kind of ANOVA. It's always the same, but with some differences. And these are parametric, parametric tests. You see, basically, there are two. There is the t-test and the ANOVA in different flavor but there are two and these are the parametric and here they say that when the assumptions are not met so normal distribution for instance or other the independent t-test can be replaced by the equivalent non-parametric like the man whitney u test to give the same information just with without assumption and with less power or the wilcox signed rank text can be used instead of paired sample t-test here within subject uh, in one independent variable uh, two level for each uh, level 
So these are some mapping between parametric tests and not parametric tests for what concern uh, interval and ratio data, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, last thing for today, we will continue tomorrow then. Uh, among all these, so this table, since it's about parametric tests, just summarize uh, tests for interval and ratio data. Uh, obviously, non-parametric tests can be applied for uh, the other two types of data, categorical uh, also. And so we will have a look at one of them. Uh, one, as I told you before, the chi-square test. It's, it's, it's written key in Italian, but it's called chi in, in English. So the chi-square test, uh, that is a non-parametric test, widely used, uh, mainly for A-B testing. So you have one interface, we have another interface, and you want to compare something in these two interfaces and see if there is a relationship between the two things, if there is a difference. It doesn't say, so it's a given interface A, a given interface B, we collect data and we, and we ask with this, this test, there is a difference in behavior between two tests or not? It doesn't say how big this difference is. It just say there is a difference or not. Um, it's a, well, a significant test used to analyze frequency count. I use this, I don't know, I click this button three times in this interface and I click this button five times in this interface frequency count among different categories like two interfaces for instance. So it's used for categorical data, uh, frequency count related to categorical data. Uh, it's to compare set of rates, percentage of occurrence, for instance, so 80% versus 70%. Is it different, significant, or is it just happened by chance? So to compare set of rate to tell, well, well, the percentage difference are statistically significant or just happened by chance. I use an interface and get some data, 80% of time and 70% of time. Is this different? Significant? Is the first interface more used or not? Or just if we get other people to do the same experiment, we have totally different, maybe inverted number, percentage. It's just to understand this. If this percentage apply to a general population or not. And even if it's a not parametric test, so it has no, it's distribution free, it makes two assumptions. So also non-parametric test can have some assumption. Uh, well, one assumption and one fact. The fact is that it doesn't work well with small sample size. If you are less than 20, uh, frequency count, the results are not re reliable. You have much more data than this. And this is the fact. The assumption is that data points in the category must be independent from each other. So you have one participant that is experimenting uh, with interface number one and a totally different participant that is experimenting with interface number two. So data points in the category must be independent from each other. And these are, this is typically used in the A-B testing. I, told you last week briefly what, what an A-B testing is, is some sort of control experiment in which you typically deploy in the wild. So you have, let's say, a website, uh, the Polytechnic website, the Portale della Didattica, for instance, where you log in, and half of the students of the Polytechnic see a new layout, and other half, totally randomly, see a totally different layout, the old one. And you want to say if they, I don't know, uh, open the forum, there is, is there a forum still in this time? Yeah, there is a forum tab somewhere? Probably. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't used 10 years ago, so if there, there is. Well, uh, in the new interface, they would like to know if they, I don't know, uh, watch more video lecture that with the old interface. So you have two group of people totally different one another and just look at how many times these two totally independent group of people watch, click on, uh, play on uh, any video lecture 
that is on the teaching portal and you change that just maybe the button or the layout for reaching the video lecture or for running the player you change something in these two version possibly one things or two not, not so much so you want to to see if there is a difference in the number and the resulting number or not often these two layout are totally independent e equal no matter which layout nobody uh, see the video lecture or everybody see the video lecture you, you don't know but you want to see if, th if there is a difference we want to know if there is a difference and if this difference is significant from each other or not mm -hmm. so tomorrow we will use this simple example to go through a uh, chi-square test mm -hmm. just to start with this uh, to finish with this uh, so you can also think about it a little bit if you want maybe tomorrow morning not today not tonight uh, i have a coin i toss a coin 20 times a coin normal coin and i have in the end of this 20 time that, that you know is just it happens to be just the upper limit of this um, doesn't work so i toss a coin 20 times and i have head for 13 and obviously tail for 7 because I I toss the coin 20 times and we assume that it is not stop uh, in the middle but if it's a coin with a normal distribution I'm expecting from what I remember from statistic to have exactly 10 times head and 10 times tail so my question is is this coin faulty is this coin made for having much more time head and tail or it's a normal coin so i would like to, to know if this coin that i haven't had in my hand well virtually uh, i have in my hand is a normal coin like every other coin in the world or is a coin that is faulty that was manipulated to have had much more time than tail maybe for some games or for magic or something like that so i will have a null hypothesis we will have a null hypothesis the null hypothesis is that the behavior obviously the behavior of the coin does not differ significantly for a normal coin that is in other words if i take any other coin uh, this 13 time is acceptable for a normal coin it may happen if it's not so different from 10. So the behavior of the coin does not differ significantly for a normal coin. And this is the hypothesis I would like to reject. I would like to see if my coin is faulty. And so I would like to accept the alternative hypothesis, that is that the behavior of the coin differ significantly for a normal coin. And again, chi-square tests don't say how big the difference is, just if there is a difference or not. So we're going to apply the chi square test to reject the null hypothesis and to accept the alternative hypothesis. Just to picture it one moment and then, so we'll have, yeah. So you imagine to have this, more or less, imagine that this is a normal distribution, sort of, and here, if this, this line is straight, here we have just a little bit of imagination you have 10 so exactly the same number before and after and in my experiment with just one coin blue, I have instead this number 13 and I would like to know if this 13 is reasonable for this distribution of it, instead it pertains to a different distribution that is general population of faulty coins or not so with case square test we will see if this distribution if this hopefully we would like to demonstrate our alternative hypothesis that this 13 is pertaining to a family of faulty coins not just normal coin and we will do all these coin uh, counts uh, operation tomorrow in the morning the bits better so we can stop here have a good night and if you have some question i'm still here for 
uh, unplugging everything.